welcome to Deschutes Public Library's online programming. I'm Liz Goodrich, and it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you all here tonight as part of our No Comics series during the month of February. Uh, and we've invited Murray Godfrey here to talk tonight about the American mythology and the, the, the story we tell ourselves about America through the superheroes and comics that we have all grown up with and love. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. This is Murray Godfrey. He is a history professor at Central Oregon Community College where he has worked since 2012. He received a master's of arts degree in history from Texas State University, specializing in the history of 17th and 18th century North America. Prior to coming to Central Oregon, Murray previously taught for Austin Community College in Austin, Texas and Alamo Community College District in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, Murray's been our great partner for so many years, uh, bringing his knowledge and wisdom about all things history. So we are super happy to hear, have you here tonight and um, let's get started. I'm gonna invite you to share your screen. Okay. So I just wanna note that uh, I'm going to be talking about comic books and technically my, my uh, comic book fan uh, history goes back further than my history background since I've been a comic book fan since 1994 when I was 12 years old. So uh, I, I actually have uh, more background in that, I suppose you could say, than, uh, than actual history since I got my degree in 20 or degrees in, in 2010. So a little bit more, a little bit more exposure there. So I'm going to talk kind of the, the, about the basic development of superhero comics in the U.S. and mostly the mainstream superhero comics. I'm not going to go too much into the various uh, alternatives uh, since we just don't have time to get into it all. I don't know if we even have time to get into the, what, everything I packed in here. So uh, just a warning, you may not see your favorite hero, hero or heroine on here because there's just so much uh, you can't really convey the whole publication history of superheroes in, in an hour. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the most famous and, and mainstream ones. So when we think of superheroes today, it's an enormous empire of uh, media, and particularly the Marvel and DC, but there's also others uh, uh, that, that have been pretty popular. A bunch of comic book adaptations have just exploded uh, in the last 20 to 25 years, really. Uh, we've seen an enormous uh, expansion of comic book characters in, all over media, merchandising, uh, and just general culture in America. It's, it's it, as a comic book fan before it was cool to be a comic book fan, which didn't really change until about the mid late two thousands. Uh, back before that comic books were more of a dorky uh, niche market. Uh, the it's kind of amazing to see what they've become. And now we have people who like, there's, there's now a big difference in the generation of fans, like the fans who grew up uh, with just comics and maybe some Saturday morning cartoons and, and other niche markets versus uh, now the mainstream markets that all these characters are in, which is just uh, unbelievable and how much money they make. And, and this is a trope of, of the history of comic books. They've always been, uh, a very capitalistic endeavor, um, always very much about making money. Uh, the business side of it has always been important. I'll talk a little bit about the business side, uh, but the purpose of them, at least from the companies that own the rights to these characters has been to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, as long as possible. So uh, that, that, is, that is something about them. But if you just look on the, this chart here, I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe alone, just the movies uh, have returned 25 billion to Disney over, um, uh, off of a 4.24 billion investment when they bought uh, uh, the Marvel property in the 2000s. So, 
it's uh, now an enormous business and that doesn't count all the merchandising and the TV shows and the, the value of the streaming platform, which is what Disney uses to show all these now. And it's just an, a, a continuous thing and looking at their roadmap for the future. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to think when it's ever going to end. I thought it was going to end five or 10 years ago and it's still, it's, it's bigger than ever. So that's where it, <laughs> Where we're at today is that this is a, a huge business worth a ton of money. And while comic books were always about business, uh, they were never as, as mainstream or huge as, as they are now in, present in, in all media. So the, the idea behind comic books really is a very ancient one. Um, humans have always had heroic fiction. Uh, going back to the first recorded story that we have, um, the, the, the first written uh, proto-novel uh, narrative, narrative story that, that we have, Gilgamesh, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, I mean, he's kind of a superhero. Uh, he's, he, he wrestles with, uh, his, uh, with, with a, a supervillain and then they become friends uh, in Kidu. And then he's, he, and then he's, uh, uh, devastated by his friend's death and goes on this quest to try to, to find himself. It's a very, it's a story that very much could appear in any comic book today. So um, those uh, he's this powerful man that wrestles and, and, and uh, shakes the world when they wrestle together. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's very much a comic book like story. And a lot of that is, is also related to kind of the ancient mythology Um. You had these these beings who were from the the celestial realm, and they had powers much greater than humans have, and they could manipulate the weather. Uh, they could could move things with their minds. They had super strength, um, but they sometimes have vulnerabilities, such as uh, Achilles from the Iliad. I mean, his vulnerability is the uh, is his heel, where the magic doesn't cover his whole body. So uh, eventually the heel does him in. Uh, another example of, a, of an ancient uh, hero or Middle Ages hero is Robin Hood, um, someone who fights for justice uh, for the downtrodden and uh, does so with, by just giving of himself and taking on powerful forces. Uh, all of these are tropes that have been very powerful throughout uh, the history of literature and people love it. Uh, the, humanity has always had these kinds of things. So, so comic books today, superhero comic books in the 20th century and 21st, they follow these narr some of these narrative tropes that have been with humans for ever since we've had recorded history. So some of the, the more immediate uh, prequels, if you will, to uh, comic books were uh, serial novels and uh, adventure novels that were marketed to young adults in the 19th and early 20th century. So uh, a good example is Sherlock Holmes there. Uh, he's a detective and he solves crimes and uh, finds the criminal so, and he has a sidekick and uh, he, he appeared in serial form. The stories came out uh, every, uh, uh, every month, every few months and then over the years and then were collected in anthologies and, and uh, he developed a lot of fans. And, and, and not coincidentally, our, one of our biggest comic book actors, Robert Downey Jr. played both uh, a comic book character and Sherlock Holmes. I mean, there's, there's a relation between uh, that character and, and what the comic books did. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs created the John Carter character. He's he fights in in, in on Mars against various uh, uh, demons and and uh, monsters, and he uh, goes to save the the exotic princess and and, and all these kinds of things. Uh, Burroughs also created the Tarzan character, which has this kind of power to uh, communicate with the animals uh, that he develops over this period of, of his difficulties growing up and, and in the wild. And, so the, and again, a very comic book-like uh, heroic narrative. Um, the first uh, known 
kind of proto comic book that appeared in America was called a picture storybook. And it's a Swedish collection collection of stories published in New York in 1842. There was a whole, there was a big boom explosion of story publishing in the Jacksonian era in the United States. And uh, so this was a Swedish character, uh, the, the adventures of uh, Obadiah Old Buck. And uh, he, some of the same kind of tropes as part comedy and part uh, adventure. And uh, it was, it was essentially sold kind of like a magazine uh, among the many other magazines, but it focused on pictures and humans also have always communicated through pictures. I mean, that even goes back further than Gilgamesh. I mean, the, uh, I forgot to mention that before the communicating through pictures in the sequence. I mean, we've been doing that since hieroglyphs. And so the, this is, it's, it's an extension of that. It's, it, but the, these different forces combined over time. You had the heroic narratives in the 19th century, the, the, the serials, and then you had picture storybooks, which were marketed to kids. So the, these were marketed to young readers uh, anywhere between 10 and, and 15. So, and they were made very cheap, so the kids could afford them with whatever change their, their parents would give them. This is the first, uh, Amer uh, the first publication we know of that would have looked kind of like a comic book uh, versus a text story like these would be. So comic strips were extremely popular in the, the early 20th century uh, and in the late 19th century. The popularity of newspapers also increased the popularity of uh, the, the comic section. And what a lot of newspapers started to do was contract with cartoonists and uh, humorists and, and, and different writers to create small strips. Sometimes they'd be just one panel, sometimes it'd be a series of, of five, six panels. Uh, and they'd put, collect these into a section of the newspaper. And what was, th this was usually, it became very quickly the, everyone's favorite part of the newspaper, uh, except for sports would be the popular part for men. But women uh, reported very quickly, women readers would gravitate to the comics first. And these were mostly humorous in nature. Uh, they, they were mostly comedy. And uh, but there were some adventure uh, stories that that would be serialized and, and would come out every week or, or what have you. So uh, they were first called comic magazines uh, when they when newspapers would publish them separately and then they'd be inserted into the newspapers, folded and inserted. Uh, that section would be called a comic magazine. So uh, that first appeared in uh, 1902. And uh, you saw the, the comic magazines get a little more sophisticated by the next couple decades. Uh, they started to appear more like actual magazines. Uh, before, they were more comparable to the pulp novels, what were called dime novels, which I've got a slide on those in a minute. But uh, <clears throat> starting in about the 19 teens, you started to see them fold the paper kind of like a magazine and either sell them in the newspaper and charge a little more for that particular paper that had this insert or sell them separately. And uh, by the 19 teens, you started to see publications like this uh, that were collected, um, collected versions of the comic strips that appeared over time in, in the newspapers. And so you could buy those by themselves. What began to look more like what we think of as comic books started to show up in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Uh, so those previous comic magazines that I mentioned were not original material. They were just reprintings of material that already appeared in newspapers. So, or, or like the, even the, the things like the Obadiah Old Buck stories. I mean, those also were collections of publications sold in, in serial form. So uh, in 1929, a publisher named George Delacorte was uh, published the first comic strip collection to feature original material and then shaped it kind of in a, 
in that rectangular shape that we're used to seeing comic books in. Uh, they were much bigger. If you this doesn't portray the size well, but they were bigger, taller, and wider than what we would think of as a normal comic book. The standardized size came out it has has gotten actually smaller over the years uh, because of the cost of paper and ink and printing. So these were bigger, somewhat more analogous to newspapers. They were because they, they were still competing with the newspapers and would be sold in the same places as newspapers on newsstands. And so they would have looked somewhat more like newspapers, but in the shape of kind of a comic book. Uh, but the, what the funnies did and the famous funnies did was uh, collect original material from the creators who, who worked on those strips. And at that time, it was pretty like, like artists who created comic strips were pretty well respected, which would not occur for standalone comic books, which is interesting. Like the original material was seen as lower brow somehow uh, than the collected comic strip material because the, the, its appearance in the newspapers and, and the, the creator's contracts with the newspapers kind of made them bigger shots than people who would create uh, proprietary content for these uh, lower rent publications. But still, most of them were focused. So uh, the Mutt and Jeff they, they, that's listed here in Famous Funnies, they, they were a popular comic strip uh, that was uh, that, that would get put in these books. And uh, still, though, mostly this was humorous material. So it was targeted toward kids, uh, kind of a lot of slapstick style humor uh, designed to make 12-year-olds laugh. The kind of things you can imagine that would make your 12-year-old laugh uh, that's what would be in these in these strips and some adventure material, but not a lot. Adventure material tended to still be in the pulp magazines, which a couple uh, of which appear here. So uh, the pulp magazines were also a precursor to comic books. So these were called pulp magazines or dime novels, uh, produced as cheaply as possible. So the kids could afford them and there'd be a variety of characters uh, featured in these uh, adventure characters who would go off and travel into exotic places and have adventures and fight bad guys, um, people who would heroes who, who, who would discover something new, some, some new place uh, like an explorer um, They'd have to fight animals, things, things like that. Um, so Frank Merriwell, you know, is is dealt with the clearing the tigers and things like that. Um, the shadow. This was a very popular pulp character who uh, targeted toward pre-adolescence, and he would solve crimes and punish criminals and uh, uh, expose the villains. And, and what was innovative about the shadow was that the media got cross uh, pollinated in, in different media. So not only did, was he a popular pulp character, but once he got a radio show in the 1930s, starting in 1931, so then the shadow became much more popular because then you can read about him and you can listen to his exploits on the radio. And they came up with a very catchy uh, audio intro for his radio show. Uh, what lurks in the, in the night, the shadow knows. It was, if you ever heard that, it was a very catchy, uh, very, very catchy hook. So this, the, the format of the funnies, the, the, the collected comic strips, and then the idea of putting original material in them, combined with these, the popularity of these adventure pulp novels, uh, combined in, in the mid-1930s. So there were some business people that thought maybe we should combine some of these phenomena. Uh, the person, interestingly, who did that uh, and was the kind of progenitor of what became DC Comics. It wasn't called DC Comics at that time until the 1940s, but... Um, essentially the founder of it, who unfortunately for him, he didn't get any uh, of the proceeds from founding DC Comics, uh, was a guy named Mal Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, 
Very an interesting guy. He was uh, he had served in the army. He had a career uh, in the army. Rose to major, and then he became a critic of uh, the military in and U.S. foreign policy in the 1920s, and he got court-martialed. Uh, and because he, he openly criticized what the army had done in a variety of missions and he exposed some of the, uh, some of the atrocities that he witnessed, uh, as a soldier in different missions. And so he served in the Philippines, which would in the early 20th century is kind of the equivalent of the Iraq war. Uh, he served in, uh, the operation Archangel, which was the post-World War I occupation of, of uh, parts of Russia to try to put down the Bolshevik revolution. Uh, he served in some of the various uh, Latin American interventions in the early 20th century. And then he, he exposed some of the, some of what he thought was wrong about what the army was doing in those missions. And he, he broke military regulations and, uh, was court-martialed and he, 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 he wasn't demoted in rank or kicked out of the military, but he, his court-martial made it where his career was going to go nowhere. So he resigned. Uh, he then tried a couple different business ventures and what he decided to do was kind of, he, he liked the pulp novels and he decided to combine that with the comic book format or, or what, or, or the, the, uh, the funniest format. And made and he solicited original material specifically for his publications from less famous creators or, or just creators who were just starting so not only was it original material but it was original characters uh created specifically at his request con with with contracts for from him to these artists and writers uh so this was the first these were the the, the first comic books essentially he, he more or less invented the comic book format unfortunately he was a very poor businessman he could never pay his bills or pay off his debts and so within a couple of years he was so bad in debt he had to give up the company like the, the the people who bought what became dc comics literally locked him out of uh, locked the door on him <laughs> and uh so he was literally locked out of the business so and in his comics kind of appeared the first, what we would call superheroes. And the first one was uh, a character called Dr. Occult, which was kind of a proto Dr. Strange like character uh, who uh, used mysticism to help solve crimes and expose criminals. And these, these appeared in, so when you buy one of these comics, again, the, the pictures here don't do credit to the size. They, they were bigger, they were like large magazine size, and they were thick. Uh, these, these things would have like 60, 80 pages of material, and they, they contain anywhere from 10 to 25 different stories. Some of the stories would only be one page, uh, uh, one page stories with a collection of maybe 10 to 12 panels. Uh, most of the panels were square like this and uniform size and uh so they're interspersed with just plain text stories and so it was it was designed as a publication that a kid could spend a dime on a dime in the 1930s so this these first came out in 1935 uh the a kid during the depression could spend a dime on them and then they get reading material for for a month uh that would keep them busy and uh, they, they'd read, you know, one story one day, another story the next day. And so they, they were they were designed to keep kids busy and designed to appeal to somewhat younger children between the ages of anywhere eight to 14 and um, still focus pretty heavily on humor. But these also had more more adventure material, uh, somewhat more reminiscent of the of the dime novels. So the, that, the, these are kind of the proto superheroes. Uh, there was another proto kind of Superman character called Slam Bradley that came out in what was what became Detective Comics, and he was he was created by Siegel and Shuster, the, the creators of Superman, and uh, but about a year before Superman, but he was very Superman like, 
and they even looked pretty similar except he didn't have the the jumping power but he would beat everybody up uh so, so there were these these uh various kind of proto characters that you can kind of see some of the the antecedents of what became uh the superheroes but where the superhero really came on the scene was was superman so uh Created by by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, uh, they were two young kids. Um, so most of the creators of these early comic books were or that that contracted with publishers like Nicholson and then his various competitors that exploded after 1938. Uh, they would either work as freelancers and they would get paid by the publisher uh, by the page. For how many pages they created and or they would work for these artist agencies that would farm out their uh their services to various publishers they wouldn't only work on comic books they'd work on commercial art and uh whatever other services uh, publications needed for artists and and writers so superman exploded in popularity very quickly right after it appeared in he appeared in 1938 so he took a little bit from a variety of uh influences like like john carter um uh, stories and things like that and also from the, the increasing popularity of science fiction in the dime novels so he was a uh alien character that came to earth and had these amazing powers and um uh, it explains what his powers were on the first page so his origin was originally told on this one page i think the whole story and, and when he first appeared in action comics was uh i think only about 10 pages it wasn't very long and uh how siegel and schuster characterized him was this crusader in in a circus costume so the costume they based on circus strongmen and they had been bouncing around ideas like this between themselves. I mean, Shigel and Shuster, so they were friends from high school. And uh, then they had moved to New York and were trying to make it in the uh, publishing business. And they had these different ideas and they, they combined these ideas into the Superman character. And at first, uh, and by the standards of the industry, they were extraordinarily successful. Uh, Superman sold like crazy. The kids loved it. Within a few months, what the publisher was hearing back from vendors was that kids are coming and asking for the book that has Superman in it. So uh, they, they were hired on to create more. Originally, they they were they, they were some of. Um, what dc comics uh better creators uh somewhat more successful but not uh uh not the stars and then they they became much more successful as a result of this as much as successful as you could be in the industry back then uh, sadly for them they sold their rights to superman their their property rights to the character uh not long after they created him which was a bad business move on their part but at the time DC started paying them higher than anybody else in the industry because of the sales. And they thought, this is great. I mean, we're getting big money, at least by the standards of the time. They're two kids in like their 20s. They're, they're making hundreds of dollars per week, uh, the equivalent of a young person today making in the uh, like over $100,000 a year. So to them, that seemed like amazing money. These were two poor kids, uh, sons of, of, of immigrants. And so to them, that seemed amazing. And so, yeah, they sold the rights to the property rights of the character to the company. That would become a problem when they realized exactly what they had given up by the later 1940s. Uh, they created him as very much a crusader for justice. So it, he was the original social justice warrior, if you will. Uh, all, any kind of progressive issue that existed by the standards of the 1930s, Superman was a champion of. In the very first issue, it's anti-death penalty. In the very first issue, he uh, he goes and intervenes in the um, in in this potential execution of a of an innocent 
criminal or a criminal that didn't actually commit the crime. And he, he goes to the governor's house and he basically gra- pulls the governor out of the, his bed and says, you are going to stay this execution <laughs> or unless I'm going to beat you up. And, uh, and then they solved it. Uh, they had Superman doing all kinds of what at the time would have been liberal things. Um, he intervened in one issue. He intervenes in uh, in a union uh, business dispute. Uh, he, he gets involved with the this this worker movement to improve worker safety in in the mining industry, and so he 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 disguises himself as a miner and goes into into the mines experiences the bad conditions. Then he goes to this party uh, being held by the owners of the mine, kidnaps them, tricks them to go into the mine and then locks the door or locks the, locks the elevator where they can't get out of the mine. And they're stuck in there in the terrible conditions where they might die. And then all the owners are scared of what they'll do. And, and, and he tells them, well, are you going to change your ways? If not, I'm going to leave you here forever. If, if you change your, if you change your ways, I'll bust you out of here because I have the strength to do it. Otherwise I'm going to leave you here uh, and, and you'll suffocate just like your, your workers. Um, and so he was, he, he was the, the champion of the downtrodden uh, in, in the book, super gods by Grant Morrison. He characterizes Superman as this uh, uh, kind of perfect hero for the new deal, almost a communistic hero because he he gives of himself without asking for anything in return and uh he he, he's um he gives everything he has because he can and that's what he feels compelled to do and so he did this in that kind of thing in issue after issue there's one issue where he goes after the corrupt politicians who are taking money from uh the the uh, orphanages he in one issue he goes after um speeding drivers uh, cars were still relatively new in the 1930s and so they, they were dangerous and he, he he demands that the city metropolis improve its safety regulations for drivers by reducing speed limits and he goes around beating up uh drivers who are breaking the speed limit every kind of um kind of bleeding heart issue you can think of that existed back then Superman was a champion of, and he was always kind of against the rich and powerful. That was for the first 10 issues. So he finally gets a, a kind of not a super powered villain, but uh, kind of a proto super villain called the, the ultra humanite, uh, which who was uh, kind of a, a early version of Lex Luthor. He's bald and he's super smart. And uh, but Superman always, his strength manages to overcome his, his uh, schemes. But in any case, uh, Superman sold like crazy, and what the DC this made DC much more successful. They were also able to do a lot of uh, cross media promotion of him. So very quickly, merchandising worked really well. Um, there were Superman costumes kids ate up uh, for all kinds of events that kids do. So they'd have their parents buy them their costumes. Uh, there were different promotions that, that, uh, they would sell with Superman's image on them. Um, toys that were merchandised, uh, with Su- Superman related themes. Uh, they were very successful in creating alternative, uh, pathways for entry into the Superman stories. Uh, radio show was, uh, uh, was created pretty quickly after the first three or four years uh, of, of Superman's publication by the early 1940s. Um, probably the most successful adaptation was, was uh, ironically enough, a comic strip in the newspaper that was more popular than the actual comic book for about the first half of the 1940s. Um, and eventually they got into serial shorts that would show before the movies, the Fleischer cartoons, which actually created some of the, uh, the tropes we know of, like um, changing in a phone booth. That was a thing the cartoon invented. The original Superman was kind of a strong man and he had super hard skin. Uh, his skin could not be penetrated by bullets. And he, he uh, could run fast, but not like... Uh, not beyond the the scope of physics fast like like what it became in the future he uh uh 
could he, he could run about as fast as a train, uh, which is where that that phrase came from. They started using in the radio show, uh, faster than a locomotive and whatnot. So uh, all uh, the various aspects of the character built over time and what the character became was kind of layered on over time. Uh, Siegel and Schuster were the writers for uh, a good first seven, eight years of his publication history. They were the primary uh, creators of him. And then they had a lawsuit against DC in 1947 or 48, which they lost. Uh, and after that, they kind of got out of the comic book business because they, the DC fired them <laughs> for suing them and, and that they had lost the suit and DC um, maintained control of the character and did what they wanted with it. And it wasn't until the 1970s they were able to get something out of it. Uh, Schuster in particular was living in poverty uh, at the time the 1970s movie came out. But uh, he, he appealed to kind of the New Deal um, culture at the time and uh uh kids ate it up and and especially kids who you know they wanted to sock it to the the man uh and superman did that again and again what's amazing to me if you and you can find so i won't endorse any of the bootleg websites that uh have this material but uh or where people have scanned their comic books you can find it pretty easily online if you want to read basically any comic book imaginable and uh fans have scanned them around the world and so you can you can find these scanned in pretty high quality and what's amazing if you read them now is how raw they were like this is kids literature but superman is pretty violent like he'll go up to someone who's uh corrupt or doing wrong and it, like one of the the stories where he's confronting like this corrupt mayor he goes up to him and punches through the wall right by his head and says you want that to if you don't change your ways this is going to be your head <laughs> and, and uh, a lot of the comic books at the time after superman were similarly violent the, the heroes would just like throw the criminals off of buildings and stuff like that it was very at the time uh there was a lot of popularity of characters um the, the like the g-man uh fbi agents uh who took it to criminals and um characters in the movies uh who, who were these tough gangsters like the james cagney character characters like that and so there was this uh rough and tumble nature to the comic books that uh fed off that kind of culture it was and there was a lot of concern about the mafia and uh in the 1930s and connections between the mafia and and, and politicians uh and a lot of people wanted to you know hit them and superman was a character that did that so yeah there's one there's there's one comic this this is the one i was thinking of where he's anti-war he actually goes so the european war that that became World War II that was uh, starting right around the time Superman was uh, becoming popular. And so in one of his issues, he goes and stops a war and then lectures everybody who was involved on how bad war is. Again, that was a progressive uh, idea at the time. Other major character coming out of that uh, early golden age era, era was Batman created by uh, Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Um, they also were inspired kind of by the circus in terms of the physicality and uh, they wanted a character that would uh, be a little bit more down to earth and but but be somewhat more like the shadow like darker and um, more visceral and so uh, bob kane was the artist uh, who created the the general uh look but bill finger uh, unfortunately for him he, he he gave a lot of input and kind of created a lot of the narrative tropes uh about like who he was and why he did what he did it was bill finger's idea for example to create the the origin story of the parents being killed and that's why he fights crime which they didn't develop that until uh something like 15 20 issues in but uh batman also took uh the 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 readership by storm the kids ate it up uh and he uh 
very quickly developed a very uh, uh, significant following. The the company was able to merchandise a lot of Batman related toys and things like that, and uh, it became kind of the core of Batman and Superman became the core of DC's uh, whole business uh, within within a couple of years. Uh, by the night by 1940, after these characters have been around one two years, uh, they were by far and away kids most popular reading is uh, most popular reading material for for boys especially uh pre-adolescence between eight and twelve wonder woman was another golden age character who was quite interesting one of the ones that lasted and uh she came out in the early 1940s and she was created by a psychologist named william moton marston who wanted to uh imbue comic books uh, children's literature with his kind of philosophy he was older than much of the writers so the creators of batman and superman they were kids um especially the creators of superman i mean they were young like college-aged kids um bob kane was a little bit old. i think he was he was upper 20s or, or or around there, but still they were young. Marston was an older established person. He was already well known uh, around the country as a premier psychologist. He had uh, created a technology that became the polygraph test, uh, the lie detector test, and was an innovator in uh, the scientific world uh, in his research about um, blood pressure and uh, lying and, and, and the, the, the effects of the brain on, on blood pressure and whatnot. And uh, so he was already well-known and well-established. And he had this kind of interesting life and philosophy in which he, he believed that, that women were morally superior to men. And I wouldn't call him a feminist per se, because he, he had some strange ideas uh, about sexuality and all kinds of things, but he he believed that there needed to be more female energy in comic books, and so he he created Wonder Woman as a character to uh, uh, to provide that energy, and uh, she hit the 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 comic book world at the right time, right at the beginning of world of America's entry into World War II. And she was colorful and she had a star spangled costume and uh, very quickly they had her involved in war issues. And, uh, and she, she was also partly based on mythology and, so, and, and she seemed to uh, embody kind of the American spirit and uh, was popular with both boys and girls. And uh, comic books tended to be marketed towards, or the superhero comics tended to be the market within the overall comic book world that was marketed to boys. Marston really wanted to market to girls and he wanted to kind of send that message to uh, kids that women can be leaders and be, uh, and be strong just like men. And they should be because he, he literally thought that if women ruled the world, there'd be no war there. there there'd be fewer problems on earth. And he, he created the idea of the, the, uh, Themyscira, the, the Amazon's homeland is this place where women had uh, triumphed over the various vices of, of men and doing that by, by not living with men. So, but they, they did eventually give Wonder Woman a boyfriend, which is interesting in the early years when Marston was still on the book, her, she was always saving her boyfriend. So it was kind of almost making fun of Superman who was always having to save his uh, female, uh, love interest uh lois lane he was always having to save her and she was kind of this powerless character that he was always having to intervene in order to keep her from getting killed and wonder woman kind of made fun of that trope and she was always having to save the steve trevor character from whatever uh mess he got in that he was impotent to uh to fix uh there's some panels where he's she's literally carrying him uh, because he would have died in some swamp or something if she hadn't saved him. So her her big uh, uh, villain was the cheetah. Uh, that's just what they used for the one of the Wonder Woman movies. I forgot to mention Batman. One of the successes of him was the Rogues Gallery, uh, 
and uh, the the effectiveness of his villains was part of what made him popular. He had very is very is idiosyncratic and uh, colorful villains, much better than Superman's, who were kind of bland villains. Besides Lex Luthor, um, the uh, the Batman villains were very creative, based on different animals, based on the clowns like the Joker. Uh, very colorful, very had had these big attitudes, and that was a very big part of why uh, uh, Batman became popular. Wonder Woman. Um, she became very popular among the troops in World War II and uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And uh, uh, her, her popularity continued as well. Uh, Marston had some interesting sexual ideas. And so he, he also was, was a fan of trying to mainstream things like uh, bondage. And so the lasso was a little bit of a, a, a innuendo. Like she would tie up these people and they would have to obey her. <laughs> and and uh, that, that was a little bit of his trying to send the message of sex doesn't have to be what the traditional idea of it is. It was also kind of a, on the on the downside. I mean, we think of she was probably one of the more progressive characters in comics at the time. But then her sidekick character um, is kind of this embarrassing, uh, fat shaming because there's, there's always go back and forth between her and uh, her sidekick about like why can't I be thin like you and strong and powerful? And she, I mean, she's always eating too many cookies and whatnot. Uh, which was supposed to be the comic relief, but uh, now it's kind of painful to read. Probably the most popular superhero of the 1940s, uh, other than Superman, and, and who even eclipsed Superman's popularity for a while, was Captain Marvel, uh, who eventually they had to change his name to Shazam. And he, the, the, he was created by um, Fawcett Comics, so a competing company with DC and very kind of Superman-like. They ended up losing a lawsuit to DC saying that they had stolen too much of Superman to create Captain Marvel. But that, that was a few years later in the 1940s. Um, Captain Marvel had Superman-like powers, super strong, could fly. Uh, but his powers came from, again, mythology, and uh, he, he met this, this wizard who combined these mythological powers into one person, and you could gain those powers by saying the wizard's name, Shazam. And uh, what really appealed to the readers of the time, because the readers are, are the pre-adolescent kids, and Captain Marvel was a pre-adolescent kid. His alter ego was a 12-year-old boy. And he had the attitude of a 12-year-old boy, both in his normal human form and in his superhero form. He was just an overgrown 12-year-old boy. And uh, the, the Captain Marvel comics focused much more on humor. And so he was uh, much more of a humorous character. Superman and Batman were pretty humorless. Uh, they, they didn't have a whole lot of levity in those comics, especially not Superman. Superman was like, you're doing wrong and I'm going to beat you up if you're, if you don't do right. Like that was kind of the message. Uh, Captain Marvel was much more about having fun. He was a kid and he got to do what every kid wanted to do, which was be big and strong and not let anyone push him around. All he had to do was say the word and he transformed into all this, this powerful character and he'd beat up all the people who would make fun of him and and uh but at the same time he'd have fun doing it and then he he gained his whole marvel family his whole series of sidekicks that could say different words and they'd become a version of of the hero with similar powers uh and that kind of that that was part of the uh the marvel family was part of the sidekick craze uh that started in the early 1940s uh Batman had his sidekick, Robin. Um, all the characters got a sidekick eventually. Uh, and usually the sidekicks were teens, uh, younger teens. And the idea was a very business-minded one. It wasn't something that all the creators were on board with. So someone who was very critical of sidekicks, interestingly, was Stan Lee, who uh, was in kind of the lower end of Marvel at the time, or what became what was called Goodman Publishing and became Marvel. Uh, he thought sidekicks were stupid. He was like, why, <laughs> why would an adult who's 30 ish, 35 ish start hanging out with these 12 year old kids 
people are going to talk. <laughs> But uh, the, the thinking was a business-minded decision. So this was kind of an editorial-driven business decision in that they wanted to market more to those 12-year-old kids. And they thought the 12-year-old kids wanted to see themselves in the comics. And so the Robin character, um, Bucky, uh, Captain America's sidekick, uh, Toro, the Human Torch's sidekick, um, what is the other speedy was the green lantern sidekick. all of them got these like 12 year old kid sidekicks as a part of trying to appeal to more 12 year old kids, which in a business sense, it was highly effective uh, in a story development sense. It seemed kind of ridiculous, but uh, that, that was a craze. And the Marvel family here was kind of part of that craze. Like, uh, but at least, at least with Billy Batson Shazam, I mean, at least he was an actual kid. <laughs> and not an adult so that takes a little bit of the creepiness out i guess if you don't think about the uh the physical age of his captain marvel character marvel what became marvel comics what uh, was called uh, goodman publishing started by a publisher named martin goodman um their characters were interesting they were never as successful as dc uh, they were somewhat more niche in their in their superhero output, but uh, their superheroes were much more kind of anti-heroes. Uh, these, even more than Superman, they, they were kind of morally compromised characters who would uh, just kind of kill people without remorse. Uh, oh, you're a criminal? I'm going to burn you alive on the Human Torch, or, or uh, and and here's you know his his psychic being like, "Atta boy, just burn these these creatures," um, which unfortunately you see the the racist tropes here, kind of the the Asian uh, race and racism here going on, the Japanese flag there, very prominent feature of 1940s comic books, um, and Submariners fighting them too. Uh, they'd just destroy their opponents and you didn't ask questions. <laughs> and and uh, so there was this kind of moral uh, culpability going on here. And Marvel was a little bit more open with this than DC, where there was a little bit more of a moral code behind what drove their characters. Uh, but these, these characters were moderately popular, Submariner, Human Torch being two of the biggest ones. And then their most popular 1940s character was part of the the world war ii comic book craze uh captain america and so captain america started before world war ii started in his very first issue he's knocking hitler out and uh embodied you know he literally wears a flag and so he embodied the kind of patriotism that was being ginned up by franklin roosevelt uh against the the anti-war activists to try to get into world war ii and then once pearl harbor was bombed then the popularity of these characters just exploded and one reason for that was because the troops loved these characters because they saw a lot of themselves in it they're like we're going to fight for the free world that's what the propaganda was telling them during world war ii and so that's what they wanted to read about and that's what captain america told them uh the war was all about and so all it, it kind of silly if you read them now most of his story 1940 stories are kind of ridiculous so his his 19 his alter ego was a private steve rogers who volunteered for a special um, experimental serum, which changes him into a, a super soldier and uh, pinnacle perfection of humanity and uh, strong and powerful, and uh, although not super powerful, but uh, kind of the pinnacle of human, uh, peak human performance. And then the the doctor that created the the medicine that makes him what he is was killed by a a spy right after the experiment and he tells steve you're going to be the only one now like you have to fight for all the super soldiers that that never uh, that, that never got to be and so he he it's a private in the army and somehow he always manages to sneak out from his unit and go across like the continent, like go across Europe and, and fight these Nazis or whatever other villains uh, somehow, and then make it back to his unit in time for Reveille in the morning. I don't know how he ever accomplished that, but that's what he had, they had him doing in a lot of issues, but uh, he would beat the heck out of Nazis and, and fascists and uh, uh, uh Tojo, who was the Japanese military commander, like they, they'd have him beaten up all those people. 
so uh, the soldiers ate this up and there were a lot of copycat characters by a lot of different companies that, that created these kind of uber patriotic characters. Uh, one of them was, uh, and they had, some of them even had pretty similar, uh, pretty similar costumes and stuff like that. So all of the characters jumped onto this bag wagon during World War II, and they and in the Captain America movie, there's there's a scene where they allude to this, where uh, they have Captain America at doing the bond, selling the bonds, and he's like, "Do you want to see me knock it off on his jaw?" Like, and that that sets an allusion to the first Captain America comic. Um, but all of the major superheroes were knocking Nazis and Japanese militarists around. Uh, sometimes in very racist ways. Uh, and uh, they were all fighting World War II and kind of part of the patriotism. And in a lot of cases, the comic books themselves were ginning up sales for war bonds and, and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of racist tropes. And even the, even the creators in their later interviews, uh, later in their lives, admitted this. They were all like, yeah, the racism was pretty bad <laughs> and they knew it uh, but, but they were directed to kind of draw the, the the comics the way the the business told them to so uh they they drew them according to the stereotypes that existed at the time that they figured would appeal to the kids of the time so particularly the anti-asian prejudice uh you see showing up with the the uh, caricatures of japanese people um some of the black characters would have be this kind of tar baby uh type um archetypes and this was unfortunately this was one of captain marvel's sidekicks his name was steamboat god <laughs> and it's it's kind of a, a, an embarrassment to the character now um but you know here's here's captain america like i'll get you for that yellow monkey and like it's, you saw a lot of that kind of thing I, at, at one point i'm looking over some of these old comics I, I could just pick up any of or open up any of them and within a few pages especially find some anti-asian prejudice the 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 stereotyped chinese and japanese characters were pretty bad um and the creators knew it and they admitted it and most of them apologized for it uh, later in their lives. The readers, like I said, tended to be young. Uh, in the early years, there were boys, meaning the reading, not just the readers of superheroes, but the readers of comic books were boys and girls. So the 1940s is really the, the height of comic book consumption. Uh, they sold far better in the 1940s than ever they ever did again in terms of unit sales, uh, how many they were selling. They were selling millions and millions of copies. And at one point, the market research that the publishers did discovered that 90% of boys and about 85% of girls between the ages of about 7 and 13 read a comic book in about a month's time so it was an enormous business so this was before tv and at a time when the major media would have been radio but radio wasn't really geared toward kids that much so comic books were kids media and marketed directly towards them uh and and something that was more colorful than what the adults were uh, had access to and so was uh very appealing to the kids um it wasn't easy to find publications with that much color all in one place and so uh the, the kids ate these up and uh Superheroes tend to be more popular among boys. They were somewhat popular among girls. Uh, not as much, though. The girls tended to read more of what were called the funny animal comics, uh, the Disney characters and, and things like that. But if you grew up, if you were a kid in the 1940s, I mean, comic books were part of your coming of age, uh, part of your, your rite of passage. I mean, kids all across America, across races, across ethnicities, they were reading these things. Uh, the creators, the first generation of creators were interesting in that most of them were, so Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, they were the creators of Captain America. I use just this one as an example of an interesting artist from the period, Lou Fine. He created a number of characters that didn't last. Uh, one of them was called the Black Condor. Um, 
created by Quality Comics. Quality Comics was what published uh, what became known as Plastic Man. And uh, most of these people were immigrants. Most of them either were from or moved to the New York City area. Uh, that was where the center of the publishing industry was. Most of them were immigrants and comic books were kind of the low end of the publishing business. They, they were the embarrassing part. You didn't really want, if you were an artist or a writer, at best, you wanted comic books to be your step up to newspapers or novels or something like that. Uh, Stan Lee, for example, talks about, he changed his name to Stan Lee because he was embarrassed to have his real name connected to comic books. So uh, his name was Stanley Lieber and he changed, he shortened it to Stan Lee because he's like, when I write a real novel, I don't want uh, my name to be associated with these low rent publications or the, these disrespected publications. But um, most of the curators were from the immigrant class, working class, and they, uh, uh, they, this was kind of their entry into the media business. And they hoped to make it into the higher echelons of it. But some of them uh, made a career of it. Usually they were paid by the page. Uh, sometimes they were contracted by the companies and other times they were uh, uh, worked for various agencies that farmed them out to different companies at the same or at different times. So, but generally speaking, they, it was a decent job for an artist. Uh, you would get six, eight, nine, $10 a page, uh, depending on how popular the character was or probably popular your, your, uh, your particular output was, um, Siegel and Schuster were paid highest in the industry, um, uh, and, uh, was good money for them, but it was not respected in the art community. What you wanted to be, if you were going to be a cartoonist, was to be a newspaper strip creator, like uh, Charles Schultz would have been the example of a high profile news uh, strip creator. That was what they would have wanted to be. Comic books were, were uh, not what you wanted to advertise uh, as, as your profession, because it would have been the, the lowest class of art. Uh, post-World War II. So after World War II, comics actually expanded. The comic book industry got bigger. Superheroes declined, though. Uh, superheroes had been, had, had, during World War II, had connected themselves to, so much to the war that it was hard to create new stories that appealed uh, with those characters. And so comic book sales were still very, very good. And probably the late 1940s was the best uh, terms of absolute sale numbers are the best times for, for uh, overall sales. But the sales were driven by uh, things like this, what were called funny animal books, uh, which were the humorous comic books, uh, a lot of them based on Disney characters. Ironically, Walt Disney would have his name on these characters but uh, and would get dividends for that. But uh, he actually did, had nothing to do with... Um, any of the comic books, uh, Disney was focused on his movies and uh, serials. He did not have anything to do with any of the output going on in the comic books, which, interestingly enough, created some of the some of the most uh, iconic uh, Disney tropes. So Scrooge McDuck was was created in the in the Dell comics that featured uh, featured Disney characters. So. Uh, but the, these were the best sellers and what kids read in, uh, in the late 1940s. And then TV hit. So comics kind of had a, an overall decline because kids started watching TV. Starting in 1950, the uptake of televisions in American households increased dramatically every year. Something like 5% of households had a television set in 1949, and then it was 35% by 1954. So uh, TV changed the game, uh, and comic books lost their market share of uh, entertainment value for, uh, for kids, where new TV shows like Howdy Doody Show and things like that were, were becoming more popular in the 50s. So what comic books started to move towards, uh, which got them into trouble in the late 1940s and 19, early 1950s, was uh, horror and, and what was called good girl art. 
um, somewhat more adult themed art. They, they, they let some of the artists have a lot more license and they created some very interesting modern looking um, images and somewhat more uh, sophisticated stories and uh even and and collectors love these because the art's so intriguing but uh it it this freaked adults out because they're still comic books are still a kid thing and so this is still being marketed towards and for kids although slightly older than the 7 to 12 year olds from the last few, the previous 10 years, but not that much older, uh, still marketed toward preteens and teens. So, and, and the teens kind of like these more gruesome horror comics like this, or uh, the good girl art was was uh, not too subtly pornographic and that the artist's uh, point was to accentuate the female form. And a lot of people, th those, those comics were selling pretty well. And uh, the adults started to freak out uh, that the, the, the parents, especially the parents who had no exposure to comics when they were kids in the teens, twenties, uh, they started to very much worry about what their kids, the baby boomers were, uh, what what they were consuming and so that brought about a government reaction starting in the late 1940s there was an increasing concern with what was called juvenile delinquency which was a moral panic of uh trying to explain crime uh trying to explain uh kids behavior these days like like every every generation has some kind of moral panic of this sort um in our right now we're going through a moral panic over things like critical race theory that's what the parents are concerned oh my god are my kids getting this information is it messing them up uh you know in prior years it would have been sex ed in in the 1970s it, it would have been um um violence in movies and 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 pornography too much sexuality in movies like, that kind of thing there's always a moral panic every generation and this was the one for the uh for the the youngest of the silent generation younger uh, or excuse me youngest of the silence and oldest of the boomers their generation had this moral panic early on in the late 1940s early 1950s over especially driven by the the success of the horror and um the, the the good girl uh <laughs> genres so the the idea was and the the most prominent uh spokesperson for this idea was frederick wortham who was a psychologist the idea was that that comic books were writing kids minds and psychologically damaging them at impressionable ages and uh, he wrote a book that was very popular called seduction of the innocent and that inspired a uh a cultural backlash against comics uh and it it fit into red scare tropes and so part of the argument was this was turning them into deviants and deviants were more likely to become communists so we have to protect our children from this and a, an ambitious senator named estes kefoffer who wanted to become president never got to uh he um came close to, uh, or he, he was a threat to win the Democratic nomination, but uh, lost to uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, the Kefauver was, was a spearhead of these hearings in the Senate uh, over poisoning the minds of kids through comics and what these comics were doing and the industry was poorly prepared to respond remember it was it, the comics industry was like the lowest level of art and writing and art and literature and so the the business people behind comic books really weren't prepared for uh, how to respond to an all-out uh, government political attack on them and so the hearings focused on 
violence in the comics, on sexuality in the comics. Uh, Wonder Woman was a particular focus of, of Wortham. He thought she was teaching girls to become uh, lesbians. Uh, the And that was going to turn them into communists because LGBT and communism were connected in the Red Scare. Uh, and the hearings were televised. And so the television uptake, so a lot of the parents saw these hearings on television and got freaked out about what their kids were doing. And so the industry, in order to protect itself, responded to this by saying, okay, fine, we will self-censor ourselves extremely because we don't want to be shut down, which is what they were afraid of. And so this had two effects. One, it changed what comics could be about. And so a lot of this, this cool stuff that came out in the late forties, early fifties, uh, the really cool kind of modern uh, art that's even pretty innovative by our standards today, uh, it had to go away. The particular, in particular, the horror, that was the genre that was hit the hardest because they focus a lot on, oh, the blood uh, that's being shown. And some of the, the creators like they, they, that showed up, or the business people that showed up at the hearings to try to defend the comics, Keith Oliver would ask them questions like, is this uh, a good image to show to children? And the, the creators would be like, well should I show a bite without any blood? Does that make any sense? I, I want to convey something uh, interesting. And, and, and that just made things worse. So, because uh, they didn't understand the, the political football that they had become. So the industry then responded by saying, okay, because of these hearings, we are going to have to change the way we operate. And so what they created was called the Comics Code Authority. Uh, which was a, a board uh, that looked over every comic, every panel, and would kick back the uh, product to the creators to recreate if there was something un unacceptable in there. And it could be it, unacceptable, could be anything. And so, right after 1954, you see like kind of cool art like kind of degenerate into uh, really stereotypical kind of 50s, it, reflecting that that 1950s mindset that we see in the culture and TV shows at the time. Uh, very straight laced, uh, very focused on uh, proper behavior, um, very heterosexual. Uh, and, you, you could have romance comics. So romance comics actually gained popularity, but they became much more G and PG rated, so to speak. Uh, the romance was very conventional, not very lurid, uh, not very, uh, not much sexual innuendo. It was all about getting married and, uh, and, and things like that. And then uh, what it, in a way it helped create what was going to come after the explosion is going to come after this period uh, because the horror comics were basically blacklisted. And so uh, and they had to close most of those horror titles down, but you could still have sci-fi comics. You could have people fighting robots and aliens, but you shouldn't have them fighting people and you could have them firing rays, but not bullets. Like they could have ray guns, but not actual guns because of the violence. So uh, sci-fi started to be focused on a lot more by the creators. There was also a consolidation in the business. So there were dozens and dozens of comics publishers through the 1940s and early 1950s uh, of varying size. DC was the big one, but and Dell, the publisher of the Disney ones, they were the big one. But uh, Marvel was kind of the next biggest. And then there were a number of other medium-sized ones and they all kind of went out of business. So there's a consolidation of the industry uh, because of this, because the medium and small publishers really couldn't compete in this new paradigm of, of censorship. Uh, so what that actually spawned was this renewed focus on sci-fi. And so they decided to try to bring back the superheroes. So the superheroes have basically disappeared. The only ones who survived the post-World War II era were Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. Uh, the Marvel superheroes all got canceled. Marvel started focusing on the horror and the sci-fi. Uh, the other DC characters, Green Lantern and so forth, from Flash from the 1940s, they had all closed down. Superman was the only one surviving, and that was largely because of the TV show's popularity helping drive his, in the 50s, helping drive his sales. Uh, Batman was barely surviving. And uh, Wonder Woman had had also kind of a, a certain baseline of popularity. Those those three three were the only main superheroes that made it through the era. Uh, most of the others all failed because of declining market. And then after the uh, 
uh, after the censorship, they had to change and focus more on kind of the sci-fi aspects. And so what DC decided to do was revive their superheroes, but put them much more in a sci-fi context where their powers are um, originate from science. So the Flash, uh, he was a revived character. They made him more kind of sleek and uh, electric than the old Flash had been. They made his powers more uh, sci-fi-ish. He got his powers from electricity, uh, it, it, from an electric accident. And uh, they also grouped the superheroes. Uh, so they, they, they created what was called the Legion of Superheroes, which is a big group of uh, kids doing heroic things. And uh, the Justice League uh, was a combination of some of their moderately popular characters uh wonder woman flash and they they uh created aquaman and brought back green lantern gave him a refresh kind of like flash made him sleeker made him more uh cold war warrior-ish instead of uh uh instead of his prior origin they made green lantern into uh a test pilot and who, who got these otherworldly powers from his ring and john jones the martian manhunter he was a detective so uh they, they uh made the origins more modern, uh, made the stories more saccharine in a way, but more sci-fi-ish where you, uh, you were dealing with otherworldly threats and not doing so much damage to other people, which had been kind of a trope in the 1940s comic books where they were beating people's heads in. So they wouldn't do it in the actual panel, but the communication was, I have thrown this person out of a window. Uh, that kind of thing went away. And this is where you get the tropes of, you know, the superheroes don't use guns ever. Uh, Batman does not kill ever, even though he's a vigilante and the easy, uh, the, the, the easy answer would be to kill the Joker. Why don't you just shoot him? Uh, th th that kind of thing uh, that, that came out of this 50s kind of uh, push to not be so violent. But the, the DC did pretty well in revamping their characters, giving them sci-fi edge, creating different uh, parallel universes for them to operate in and operate in their own contained universes that would sometimes cross over all that were, were DC innovations who really though became popular in what became known of as the silver age it started after the comics code uh, started in the late 1950s with this new sci-fi interest. Uh, Marvel really went overboard and uh, started to eclipse DC sales in the 1960s and uh they did that in a, in a handful of interesting ways. So Marvel was about to go out of business. They never really could recover from their char main characters losing their popularity. And they, they were floating on uh, kind of break even margins off their sci-fi and horror or not horror, their, their sci-fi and their romance uh, books. So they really weren't making any money. Uh, Stan Lee had been in the business for 20 years and he was kind of sick of it. He was like, this isn't going anywhere. My reputation isn't being helped by this. Uh, I'm going to quit. And before he quit, he decided that he was going to, his wife convinced him to write a comic like he would want to write it and not worry about what the publisher's pressuring him to write. So he's like, fine, I'll, I'll write a couple last stories uh, that reflect more what I would like to write. And so that, that, with that came Fantastic Four in 1961. And there was much more of a, he, he drew from the romance comics and then he put, he combined superhero adventure stories with uh, soap opera type drama and teenage angst and kind of aimed the stories a little bit higher in age than typically superheroes had been aimed. Uh, they, they had typically been aimed at those pre-adolescents. And so he aimed them more instead of like 12, 11, 12, 13, he aimed them more at like 16 year olds, 17, 14, 15. Like kids that are starting to explore their um, sexuality, explore their relationships, uh, explore their, their futures. Like he put a lot of that angst into the comics. And uh, so he gave them the, the Fantastic Four had this fine family dynamic. He also gave them more pathos. So the thing uh, is this character who's been physically disfigured and he can't be fixed. 
And uh, the the scientist that that the, the leader of the team, Reed Richards, is a scientist who, who convinced his friend to go with him on the experiment in the space. Um, it feels guilty for causing him this, even though they've got these powers, he can't fix his friend. Uh, and he, he has this guilt he has to deal with for it. And, and the thing is always being looked at weird by people like, oh, what's that monster? And so this is a monster who's supposed to be a hero. And he's kind of dealing with that dramatic tension. Um, and then there's the, the, the family dynamic, the human torch and his sister. So they recreated the human torch as a teenager. The old human torch had been an Android. Uh, they create him as a teenager, kind of hothead who's always acting up and wanting to uh, explore, uh, his life and the way he feels is fit. Spider-Man uh, was kind of the culmination of Lee's uh, of Lee's production in the 1960s. By far, became the most popular Marvel character and uh, started selling like crazy right after he first appeared. And the innovation here was um, Lee's idea was to take the sidekick theme but make the sidekick the actual hero. And so Spider-Man was a young character that would have been, Peter Parker was the age of character that would have been a sidekick in the old comics. Lee never liked sidekicks. He thought they were stupid. He's like, I'm going to make a high school kid into the actual hero. The actual heroes were usually like 35. Uh, Batman, Superman, I mean, they're, they're age 35, 37, generally. So here comes Peter Parker, who's Spider-Man, but he's just like, 16 year old kid and uh all the kids could kind of identify with him and what was particularly innovative was all the soap opera aspects they put into it uh so and i always thought it was funny because what made what made spider-man popular was that he's always kind of having to balance his life with his superhero life and the superhero life is both kind of a a, a, a blessing and curse for him because he has to hide it and hiding it is hard and he can't tell everyone who he wants to be where the old superheroes were kind of like, they, they had their secret identities, but their secret identities were just kind of silly and stupid. They didn't even care about them. Superman is Clark Kent. Really. There's no difference between, between them. It was just the, the convenient alter ego when he needed it, where Peter Parker was an actual high school kid with all the problems of a high school kid, but he can put on the costume and be Spider-Man on the, on the, but on the other side in his real life, he's got all the same teen problems. So uh, he's always losing girlfriends. So he's always struggling with, Oh, are girls going to like me? Like every kind of young boy in high school, like, why can't I get the girl I want? And if only they knew I was Spider-Man and then it, it, maybe if one of them likes him, uh, he has to leave her because something happens and he has to go be Spider-Man. And then the girl, uh, is upset about him leaving. And so he deals with that angst. Well, ironically enough, he did get like the cutest girlfriends. So, uh, Mary Jane Watson, which was, who was introduced to the, the, it was a very, uh, effective build up to her introduction. They introduced her over like 10 issues where P P Peter's aunt keeps saying, Hey, I've got my next door neighbor's niece. She wants to meet you. And they keep, and Peter, every issue for like 10 issues is like, no, I don't want to have this blind date with some ugly girl. <laughs> and, and uh, then it turns out like she's this bombshell redhead. Uh, one of the more famous panels in comics she's where she uses the tiger um, pet name for him. And uh, John by John Romita, who was one of the brilliant artists of that period. And uh, she and Gwen Stacy are his two girlfriends that he kind of juggles back and forth. And somehow, despite being the awkward science nerd, he somehow gets like the hottest girls uh, who really uh, rep both of them represent kind of the go go 60s uh, culture at the time. Gwen Stacy was always wearing the boots and the short skirts and, and stuff like that. So uh, that was just that, that was just part of kind of the Marvel age. So different characters that Lee uh, spearheaded kind of make up what the core of the popular Marvel characters are now. And it was an immense period of production in a pretty short time. About 10 major characters that kind of make up the Marvel core all came out in a period of about eight years between 1961 and 69. And uh, Thor was one of the popular ones, Iron Man, uh, Ant-Man, and Hulk. And all of these had some kind of dramatic tension. And they also brought back Captain America and gave him some dramatic tension as well, because he's now, uh, they, they recreated him as a character kind of out of time who, who has to reconcile that he's no longer lives in the time he was supposed to live and he lost his best friend and he can't really process that. Um, 
Thor was kind of this Shakespearean type character based on like Shakespearean archetypes. Uh, the Hulk is kind of a Dr. And Jekyll and Hyde type character. Uh, Ant-Man kind of more of the sci-fi-ish, uh, uh, sci-fi-ish character. And, all, and, and a lot of these, uh, the Hulk and, and, and Iron Man all kind of feature, uh, and Spider-Man 2 feature the, the interest at the time in Cold War technology. Uh, the first, the, 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 when the first Iron Man, what, what Tony Stark's actually trying to do is fix the government's problem in Vietnam. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the tropes of what was going on in the sixties, uh, were reflected in, in these, in these characters, the concern about radioactivity, uh, uh, concern about, uh, science gone wrong, uh, and, uh, kind of otherworldly, uh, threats and, and, and whatnot. Hulk, they turned from gray to green. So originally he was intended to be gray. Uh, they turned him to green because the printers could not get the gray right so the different in the first issue of the hulk he was different shades of gray like in different pages and they couldn't fix that and so they're like fine we'll, we'll make him green um until we got the green skin that ended up being more popular DC's comics uh, were much more conservative in nature, but where DC took off at the time was with the Batman TV show. I mean, it was huge. Uh, it, from 1966 to 68, it was this short-lived but amazingly intense phenomenon where uh, just the, the ratings of the Batman TV show were insanely high. It basically... ABC was kind of a failing network before Batman. And then when they got Batman, it uh, made them the best, uh, the, the most popular network. And uh, it was very effective because it kind of, it, it was both relevant in that the characters dealt with issues. So Batman in the TV show dealt with kind of modern issues like drugs and, and things like that. But then in, in a way that, uh, combined the silliness of pop art that was also popular in the 1960s and kind of gave this levity to it. And so it was very effective visually. It was somewhat relevant and they were dealing with issues of the time, but doing so in a comforting way. And um, Adam West, complete as the actor who played Batman, completely embraced the comedic nature of it. He, he kind of was like, when he did his screen test, he busted out laughing how silly the whole idea was. And, and, and the, the producers loved that. And he played that, that sense of levity with the character, uh, which was really not the original intention of the character. Batman is kind of a humorless, I'm going to kill criminals type character. And uh, he became much more... Um, about the gadgets and kind of more of a James Bondish uh, kind of uh, uh, wise cracking character. He also, at the same time in the comic, got a new look. Uh, they made him more sleek, uh, gave him a little more color by giving him the yellow uh, belt and and uh, moon behind his behind his bat symbol. And uh, the comics reflected kind of what was going on the TV show too. His 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 villains got uh, more uh fantastical and, and and more uh silly uh there was a, a reaction to the civil rights movement in the comics uh with with the black characters so uh marvel went further than dc on this marvel was usually the publisher for willing to push the envelope a little bit more on the social issues uh their first major black character well their first black character was actually a war character in the um in the Nick Fury comic, but uh, the, their first major black character was Black Panther. And uh, he was this African character that came from this kingdom that had this amazing uh, metal and made them very technologically, the most technologically advanced country in the world. And he was the prince of the country and we had to become the king. And he first appeared in Fantastic Four and then he got his own comic and the name obviously, um, was uh, drawn from the Black Panthers uh, uh, movement uh, going on in the late 1960s. And so he, he reflected kind of that uh, pro-Black pro nationalist uh, idea of the civil rights movement. Uh, the first African-American character or major character was Luke Cage. Uh, he was a criminal from Harlem. He was in jail and then he they offered him uh, kind of a serum, kind of like Captain America to make him into a superhero and it made him super strong and, and durable. 
And uh, he, he kind of has a lot of these, he deals with a lot of kind of the race issues in, in Harlem at the time. And then Captain America took on a black sidekick who, well, not really a sidekick, more of a partner uh, named the Falcon, who wasn't a very interesting character uh, in terms of his development, but was uh, fascinating in terms of the equal billing they gave him. And uh, throughout the 1970s, Captain America was often the vehicle that Marvel used to kind of push various social causes. So there's one arc in the mid 1970s in which Steve Rogers is so disgusted by the Watergate scandal, he, he can't be Captain America anymore. He tells the Falcon, I can't do this. I, I don't know what America is about anymore uh, because of what's happened. And I'm, I'm not going to be Captain America. And he throws down his shield and takes off his uniform and he becomes like a a different kind of hero that doesn't have the American symbol. And the Falcon and his friends have to try to kind of build him back to it. Um, the, the major publishers didn't go into too much radicalism, but they did reflect countercultural impacts. Uh, in, in particular, a series of stories that appeared in the late 1960s, 1969, uh, that dealt with drug addiction. And so this was, and, and a couple of these had to be made without the Comics Code Authority uh, stamp because the, the, the Comics Code Authority would not allow uh, the characters to promote drugs, even though they were fighting against drugs in the stories, but uh, the, just going into the details of what the drugs impacts had on characters uh, was something that was too much for the censors. And so in a couple of cases, they had to print them without... Uh, uh, without that censorship. Critically, these books were very well received, although they didn't uh, sell that well. But they did kind of raise the bar in terms of the, of the literary value. X-Men were uh, one of Marvel's innovations that were also kind of culturally relevant to clear ties to the civil rights movement. Um, these were characters who were different uh, in terms of their genetics, and they, as a result, they were persecuted. And so the the leader, their leader, Professor Xavier, decided to make a special school for them where they could be protected from the world, but also help the world. And uh, they were never super popular. Their stories in the 1960s were pretty tall uh, and pretty formulaic, but they they were revived. So this was the first of the major Marvel uh output of the the 60s to be canceled and they revived in the mid 1970s with a much more diverse cast um yes colossus here was a russian uh, storm was an african uh princess uh nightcrawler was was looked non-human and he was also german uh they had a thunderbird here was a native american wolverine was a canadian and so they uh uh they, they they created the cast to be much more diverse and dealt with more kind of relevant issues uh of the time much more psychologically uh relevant issues of things like addiction uh, mental health uh things things like that media adaption started to increase the reach of comics so the superman tv show had been a good example of the 50s basically that saved superman uh in the 50s when superheroes declined uh, in the 70s they got uh uh, a beauty queen, Linda Carter, to play Wonder Woman, who and she she was kind of a sensation for a couple of years. Um, and The Incredible Hulk was a quite effective TV show in the late 1970s uh, that helped uh, increase Marvel's uh, 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 Marvel's footprint uh, in in the the cultural uh, milieu. DC at the same time had kind of stagnated uh, throughout the 70s and 80s. So the X-Men in the 70s and 80s became huge. Uh, the various Marvel characters, Spider-Man just got more and more popular. Um, DC's characters were not getting so popular. Their comics were kind of failing and they, their, their continuity was so convoluted by the 1980s like they didn't really know what to do with these characters so uh kind of coinciding with uh, with the film adaptations of their two major characters superman and batman they also revamped the comics um and redid the continuity which is something that that comics kind of have to do now again and again because they were never created to last forever 
the creators never thought these things would last 50 or 100 years. So you have all these this this history that has to be dealt with. And so eventually you just kind of have to scuttle it uh, and restart the characters. So John Byrne uh, restarted Superman, gave him a new origin, kind of gave him less power. Um, Superman in the 1970s was doing some ridiculous things. Like he, he could like take a planet and throw it like a baseball. Like it, it was ridiculous how powerful he was. So they depowered him somewhat, uh, gave him villains that were more... Um, more dangerous to him they did a big revamp of lex luther instead of a mad scientist he was this business tycoon uh and uh, just made the stories a lot more uh relevant to the 1980s the the batman movie also coincided with kind of a darker look at batman kind of return to that 1940s dark uh, view of him versus the lighter 60s kind of campy version of him that was reflected in kind of the bronze age of comics the late 70s and 80s uh darker look at superheroes where the creators now targeting their stories toward much older readers now you're targeting toward them towards not just late teens but 20s college age readers and and, and people who have been fans of comics like the people who read the comics when they were 15 in the 60s are now 35 in the 80s and they kind of want more mature stories so and they're still reading these comics so they the the creators started to put out more um darker comics that also reflected kind of the darker culture in media at the time in the 1980s things like rambo uh you know these the anti-heroes the effects of vietnam where the heroes aren't all good uh watchmen was a great example of you know if superheroes were real they would be screwed up messed up people and we're going to explore what that means and batman the dark knight returns was was similar in the sense of if there really was a batman and he lived beyond a few years he would be a psychotic person so uh how would that manifest and what would the world be like with such people so you started to see more of that kind of those kind of tropes explored uh also comics instead of being sold by new in newsstands by the 1980s were being sold by uh comic book shops and uh so appealing to a much more niche a smaller audience that didn't buy as many comics but bought them more consistently so you didn't sell as many books because you weren't reaching as many kids, but you did sell a lot of books to the same kids uh, and, and now adults that uh, have grown up with comics and want to see their characters mature just like they are. And so you're seeing, you see much more adult stories. In the 90s, they took this too far, expanded things too much. So there was a collectible boom because of the explosion of comic book shops and uh it was like any bubble uh at some point you grow the bubble too much and it's going to pop and so the the publishers focused too much on these variants where you would sell multiple copies of the same book for speculative purposes so the collectors would purchase a ton of them and try to resell them so like these four different variants of the x-men number one in 1990 i think this was 91 or 92 when when that came out in the 93 they did the death of superman which they stretched over like 50 different titles in order to sell as many as possible to the same folks who are buying all of this story arc. Um, and it just, it created a bubble. It created both a bubble in the amount they published and a bubble in the speculation of the back issues, uh, which uh, crashed and created a crisis for the industry and uh marvel went bankrupt again uh but in the 90s the bankruptcy was pretty serious they sold all the rights to their characters to different movie studios trying to stay afloat financially dc did a little bit better but uh also had overextended themselves so uh, by the late 90s, they were looking at ways to revive their, their properties. And what was really successful was the uh, movie versions of some of the popular characters from the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So uh, X-Men came out in 2000, and it reflected a shift away from kind of focusing on the campy uh versions of the characters and kind of focusing on more gritty kind of taking that dark knight kind of approach to the character um the closest that had come to that before was uh the the 1989 batman movie had kind of taken a film noir look at batman but they still there was still some camp to it the joker character was very campy uh the the x-men took more of kind of a realist approach which uh came from that 80s and 90s influence 
Spider-Man movie came out in early 2000s and then the revamp of the Batman movies came out in the late 2000s and that revived the comics uh, that direct market got bigger again comic sales became very tied so the comics started to tie themselves to the movies more and more the characters in the comics would start to take on the, the costumes of the movie characters and, and so forth um, then you had the introduction of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the late 2000s. This was not actually expected to be as big as it became. The first Iron Man movie was reasonably uh, popular, but it was far eclipsed by The Dark Knight, which came out a couple of months later in 2008. Both of these came out in 2008. Uh, and um, there were other movies that year that came out that were much bigger. So it wasn't at the time we didn't know that this was going to be as big as it was, but Disney bought it and they exploded it. Part of what I think the culture uh, helped comics out was kind of the, the, uh, the, ch the shift from making comic superhero culture from something geeky into something cool, like, like geeky, but also chic. And I think the big bang theory TV show had a lot of that. A lot of comics fans and a lot of just people saw themselves in these characters and uh they loved comics. They loved the culture. They had grown up with it. And as, as young adults, they were still a uh, part of it. And so it, people ate that up and it, it became, I remember it was about the time that show came out, it became popular to wear the comics memorabilia, wear the t-shirts and stuff like that, get, collect the stuff. Whereas before you kind of hide it, like you, if you started dating a girl, like you wouldn't tell her, Oh, I, I, I have comic books at home. Like you'd hide that. But after this, it got kind of popular and, 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 and mainstream. And then the, the Marvel cinematic universe exploded in popularity in the early 2010s, uh, largely using that same Stan Lee approach of, um, keeping a lot, keeping the comics uh, relevant, but also funny. Like the characters are dealing with serious issues. Like they're dealing with issues like, uh, you know, alcoholism and uh, government surveillance and um, things like that. But they're also laughing at themselves. And that was a Stan Lee trope that he used back in the 60s. And, and it, it, it worked really well in the cinematic universe. Um, and has, has just it kept its popularity going and going that using that formula. Uh, lately, the comics have, have been have decided to be go more progressive and we're seeing a lot of interesting moves to make these characters more diverse uh, to kind of race shift and gender shift different characters, which is necessary. I think they have to do something interesting. There's only so many times you can have, you know, uh, Superman save the world from some alien. Uh, you need to have him do something interesting. So they recently revealed that the current Superman, which is actually the son of Clark and Lois, uh, that he's bisexual. Uh, Iron Man, they had uh, a black uh, woman, a young black woman uh, take over the, the Iron Man character uh, and for a while. And so the, all this, uh, the, the comics have very much embraced various social justice movements in, in the last especially five eight years uh, and uh, that going in, in in a direction that in the prior decades they would have been a little bit hesitant to because of the, the censorship and the, the need to uh, appeal to the, the larger market so that's kind of where we are today where it's this cultural phenomenon that really kind of defines our uh, def defines our culture in a lot of ways it's really be, it's equivalent to what the western was but even bigger i think uh the the, the western movies from 1940s to 1960s were a huge phenomenon um the superheroes are just as big if not bigger than that i, I thought they were going to go out years ago I, I thought that the early 2010s i was like they've pushed this as far as they can there's no way this is going to remain popular, but it's, uh, they, they've managed to just uh, make it more and more popular, amazingly enough. So uh, here's some, some resources. If you want to read more about all this, uh, there's a lot of different uh, ways to analyze what superheroes have meant to Americans uh, and kind of what they represent. I think something like, you know, Iron Man's popularity, you know, he's a tech mogul, you know, it's, 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 it's very relevant to our time. So, uh, and, and superheroes tend to reflect this. So yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so Scotty wants to know, why do you think parents went against comics so bad when they had hearings? Uh, whereas they, what, 
why do you think they went against comics, but not against rock and roll? Oh, they did go against rock and roll. <laughs> so that was a <laughs> yeah, new movie. Both. So uh, uh, th- there was also a moral panic about rock and roll. That was, there were people who thought communists were pushing rock and roll to corrupt their minds, which is kind of ridiculous given that rock and roll is like the ultimate capitalist innovation in music. But uh, the, th- those, those kind of went together. Uh, rock and roll is marketed a little bit toward older, older teens, comics toward younger teens. Um, so, so both was going on and they both were censored or both were attempted to be censored. Music was a little bit bigger business. Comics were a smaller business. So they were a little bit more able to be intimidated than, than the music business. But, um, yeah, it was all part of the same moral panic during the cold war, uh, of, you know, deviants messing up our culture and making us un-American. Uh, that, that was, that was all part of it. So, uh, also, um, for why comics uh, were, were a little bit more impacted business wise, um, they just they weren't as rich as the music industry. The music industry had more money. Uh, comics uh, at the time didn't have as much, so uh, they, they didn't have as much ability to fight back, and didn't have they didn't have the star system like with rock and roll. You had Elvis and people that that were pretty hard to fight back against because they're so popular. Comics did not have stars. They had properties. So uh, the business end of that was much more sensitive. Right. So I'm wondering, do you have a sense of, um, I mean, there's been so much really great innovation in the comic industry. When you think about ta Coates writing Black Panther. Yeah, I didn't even mention comics. that. I mean, what do you see uh, comics really cementing itself as a port, an important cultural movement. Yeah, they, they definitely started, they started to embrace a little bit of that in the 1960s. But what I noticed in the 2000s is when they really kind of took on. So September 11th, they came out with all these special issues where they really tried to make themselves relevant. Captain America had this really interesting arc post September 11th, where he's confronting terrorists and then having to confront what he's become because he's confronted terrorists. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the creators had, were given a lot more license uh, after the 80s uh, as the comics code kind of went away. The, they gave creators more control. Uh, creators now have a little bit more ownership. Uh, the, the creators now can get a little bit of percentage of sales. Not a lot, but they, they get a little bit more. Um, creators back in the 70s and prior were hired help and they were treated pretty bad. Uh, the publishers were pretty much tyrants over them. And so they had to, uh, they, they, they had to kind of do what they were told, especially DC. DC was the more corporate uh, kind of stuffed shirt, uh, corporate, let's not rock the boat uh, publisher. So and Marvel had created a little a style that was a little bit more lenient, but there was a limit to that leniency. They couldn't go too far. Like they couldn't embrace the counterculture. They could address it, but not embrace it. Um, but yeah, now I think they've embraced progressivism. I think the creators are just these, these people who are uber progressives and I think they've embraced it. I mean, they're artists. So, uh, I think they've embraced differences, um, and, uh, they, they want to, to push that message. And I think they know that what they create in the comics is now viable to become mainstream media because, what the MCU has done has done what was innovative in the eighties and nineties, what the movies had done what was, what was innovative 20, 30 years ago. So I think the creators now know that in the 2030s or forties, what they're doing might become mainstream phenomena, cultural phenomena. So I think they're conscious of that. Yeah. I just, I love, you know, my brother was a big comic book fan with all the action heroes and um, definitely Wonder Woman is my my favorite. Uh, yeah. They give us some hope. They give us some understanding on how a, a way to look at the world. And I appreciate the work that is being done in the, in the comic world and the movies for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the last big question. Oh, okay. So last remarks, Murray, do you have anything else? Cause I got one big last question. Oh, that's, uh, uh, Everybody I, I, wants I to I'm know. Good. I've, I've talked a lot. <laughs> We have one last question. Everybody wants to know, and I know because you told me before we started 
who is your favorite superhero and why? Uh, my favorite is Captain America. And uh, I was I was drawn to him one uh, the kind of from an early age when I, when I went to comic shops uh, I was just drawn to that particular comic because uh, the first comic I ever bought was an Avengers comic uh, and I thought Captain America had the coolest part in there uh, and then I, I, I embraced the other Avengers character and I just I just kind of like the sense of you know he's the non uh super powered of them and yet is able to kind of do he's able to be the leader even though he's the weakest like he doesn't have the cool suit and he doesn't have the godlike powers or or the uh um uh you know scientific uh induced powers or whatever like he he has he, he he's essentially a good athlete and uh and has to use has has to use his his hum humanity really to to win so um yeah he, he was always my favorite character and uh you know i just i kind of like the the idea of kind of fighting for what's right i mean captain america by the point i started reading him was was you know focused on uh trying to be about what made america good and uh, i was drawn to that so but i i liked a lot of the characters I and mean, i liked both marvel dc and i like some of the alternatives that i didn't get to talk about like vertigo and or um image and whatnot or dark horse comics but uh it, it, the i like all of them but that was that was my original favorites the second favorite would have been spider-man so uh, love, love spider-man <laughs> yeah yeah i mean he, he he's kind of the the i always lean a little bit more toward marvel than dc even though i like dc their continuity is so convoluted i could never i could never quite get it right all the all the different universes it never made sense yeah I love it. The storytelling is so important um, to, and, and I just love the idea of the comics and the DC and the Marvel universes just walking alongside our belief in who we are as human beings uh, and Americans. So this has been really, any last questions? Oh, oh, so Tom wants to know, will you create a program for the hero cowboys? Yeah, I probably should. Bob Jones, um... Cisco Kid, et cetera. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's interesting <laughs> modern versions of that, like Jonah Hex and whatever. Um, the, uh, yeah, the Westerns were popular. It, I, I, I didn't talk about those kind of adaptations, but, you know, Westerns, um, Star Wars, uh, all, all those kind of things have had, have had impact. Ooh, let's on, do on Star Wars. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Star Wars actually appeared as a comic first before it came out as a movie. They yeah. gave it the story. Let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so. Okay, so really want to thank you. This has been really great. Cool. So, say good night. You guys are great. Love the discussion. Um, check out all the great programs on our YouTube channel. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.